Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen, and I thank you so much for listening today. As always, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, just by subscribing via email, uh, we'll get you a 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. Uh, great refresher if you're out uh, in clinical practice, uh, as well as if you're taking pharmacology courses or taking board exams soon. Um, definitely, I think, a, a helpful uh, real-world kind of uh, uh, experience where I shared my most important clinical pearls with those top 200 drugs. So you get that absolutely for free. Uh, for subscribing to reallifepharmacology.com. And obviously, we'll get you updates when we've got new content, new podcasts, and things available too. So again, go check that out, reallifepharmacology.com. All right, so let's do the drug of the day today, and that is propranolol. Uh, brand name of this medication is Inderol. And in clinical practice, I feel like I'm seeing it less and less, um, but there definitely are certain circumstances that I, I do feel that I, I see it from time to time for sure. So uh, this drug is a non-selective beta blocker. Uh, we did a general overview of uh, beta blockers, but I definitely wanted to uh, dig down into a little bit more specifics with propranolol specifically here. Um, so it has, if you look it up, it has tons of indications. Um hypertension, uh, you know, tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, uh, post-MI, chronic stable angina, so lots of cardiovascular indications. And I can tell you from a clinical practice experience, uh, it's virtually never used for just that specific reason. And um, one of the reasons being it's a non-selective beta blocker. So generally, there's, there's probably going to be a broader adverse effect profile or more risks potentially with using propranolol compared to uh, a cardioselective agent such as metoprolol, for example. So that's why you really don't see it used very often for, for, for cardiovascular things. Now, so there are some kind of more oddball uh, type indications that uh, I definitely do see it occasionally used for. So uh, essential tremors, an example that I've seen it used for quite a bit. Um, migraine prophylaxis, another potential situation there. Uh, esophageal varices, maybe not quite so much anymore, but occasionally uh, see that. Uh, occasionally for um, performance anxiety disorders, kind of on an on a as-needed type of basis. Uh, Lithium-induced tremor, um, antipsychotic-induced akathisia, uh, and thyroid storm is kind of one uh, last one that occasionally you may see a non-selective agent like propranolol used for. So let's talk about that selectivity a little bit. So that adverse effect profile is going to be dependent upon um, propranolol basically being non-selective. So propranolol blocks beta-1 receptors, which is commonly kind of referred to as uh, some of the cardiovascular type receptors, uh, but it also has beta-2 blocking activity, and that's going to uh, primarily impact, or at least where it's taught, it primarily impacts the lungs. So if you remember, a drug like albuterol is a beta-2 agonist. Well, propranolol is going to potentially blunt that effect. Um, so that can lead to bronchospasm and worsening of respiratory conditions such as asthma and, and COPD and, and other respiratory conditions as well. So that's one of the major issues um, with using a non-selective agent versus a selective beta blocker. Uh, other adverse effects, uh, we are going to drop that pulse, we're going to drop that blood pressure, so that can be good and bad um, depending upon what we're trying to do there. Um, fatigue, definitely my geriatric patient population uh, fatigue is one of those adverse effects that I have seen. And um, sometimes it's maybe due um, just to the drug itself, but um, other times I've, I've definitely seen maybe too aggressive of starting doses with propranolol. And so that's something to, to keep in mind as you start this drug and, and titrate up, um, making sure that we're not uh, inducing too much uh, fatigue there. And as part of my differential in like a polypharmacy 
type patients. So if you note that patients have to increase caffeine intake or maybe even in severe cases, a provider starting stimulants like methylphenidate because of, you know, low energy and things like that. Or, you know, maybe they're, they're feeling that fatigue is due to depression, uh, something like that. Um, I'm definitely going to go back and look at that medication list and say, hey, you know, are they on a beta blocker like propranolol, which can definitely induce some of those symptoms. Uh, sexual dysfunction definitely has been reported uh, with a drug like propranolol. And then also masking of some of the symptoms of uh, hypoglycemia. That's another important consideration, uh, particularly in your patients uh, with diabetes and or those who have experienced um, hypoglycemic events. Uh, one last thing on the adverse effect profile that I definitely wanted to mention um, really important, I think, patient education point. Uh, abrupt discontinuation can potentially increase the risk for uh, acute coronary syndrome type events, uh, particularly in patients at risk for acute cardiovascular events. Uh, so it's really, really important to make sure that your patients are consistently taking the medication and we don't have periods of, you know, where maybe a patient goes on vacation and they forget their med. Um, we don't have those periods of multiple days missed dosages, um, and that's due to that um, boxed warning risk of abrupt dis discontinuation, uh, which could lead to an increased risk for cardiovascular problems. Uh, dosage forms I did want to mention uh, before we get into to drug interaction. Uh, so there are, you know, LAX, XL, immediate release type formulations. Um, in practice, I have seen errors in mix-up due to these different formulations. So um, very, very important to, you know, take that into account and, and making sure that if you're on the dispensing side, we're giving out the right medication. Uh, if you're on the medication administration side or taking the medication, um, definitely speak up and say something if you see that that pill looks different than it used to look, okay? That might indicate that um, there may be a mix-up in long-acting versus immediate release uh, type of, of dosage forms there. All right, so let's take a quick break from our sponsor and we'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material like BCPS, BCACP, BCGP, BCMTMS, uh, psychiatric exam, or even the NAPLEX if you're a pharmacy student. Uh, we've got links to tons of different content um, that are available to you. Your support there at meded101.com slash store definitely helps grow our podcast and helps support uh, financially this podcast as well so all uh, can benefit from it. So uh, also if you're a nurse practitioner, PA, med student, uh, physician, all sorts of different resources, uh, recent books on drug interactions, uh, perils of polypharmacy. Uh, we've got some Audible books. We've got Amazon books. Uh, so lots of different ways uh, if you like to consume content and have some refreshers or potentially learn some new things. So all those links to all those books, all the study materials, meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. All right, so let's finish up with drug interactions, and there's definitely some significant ones to, to get to. So uh, first off, I want to start with propranolol. It is a weak CYP1A2 inhibitor. Um, so there aren't a ton of meds that, that follow the, the CYP1A2 pathway, but um, you know, a drug like tizanidine, a drug like theophylline, um, concentrations could potentially go up on account of adding uh, propranolol to a patient who's already uh, taking those medications. Uh, other examples, other things I wanted to talk about. So um, propranolol is broken down by CYP1A2 as well. So CYP1A2 inhibitors can increase concentrations of propranolol. So uh, classic example, uh, ciprofloxacin, uh, fluvoxamine, an SSRI or, or Luvox brand name there. Uh, so those are a couple examples of meds that could increase propranolol concentrations. 
uh, inducers uh, can reduce concentration. So uh, inducers of CYP1A2, those are, are many of your classic examples, rifampin, carbamazepine, phenobarbital. Um, one unique one uh, to think about is smoking. Uh, so smoking tobacco, that can actually lower concentrations uh, of propranolol. So kind of an interesting one there to kind of think about and remember. Uh, and I believe in the uh, clozapine podcast, I talked about uh, that as well. So definitely go back and refresh yourself uh, on that drug interaction as well. Now, additive effects, uh, we definitely got to think about blood pressure and pulse uh, so blood pressure, first off, any blood pressure lowering medication um, can certainly have additive effects, but I also think of drugs that aren't classically referred to as antihypertensives. So, you know, your PDE5 inhibitors, such as like sildenafil, for example, um, your agents used in um, Parkinson's disease, such as Cinemet, that's a blood pressure lowering agent. So we've got to remember that those two uh, can have additive effects when used with a drug like propranolol. Uh, the lowering of, of pulse or bradycardia risk, uh, that can certainly uh, have additive type drug interactions. Uh, so I think of um, centrally acting alpha-2 agonists such as clonidine, for example, that can have additive pulse lowering effects. Uh, dementia medications that you might not think of, uh, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors can drop pulse as well. Uh, so your denepazils and your uh, rivastigmines, for example, um, so that can certainly have additive effects there too on the, the pulse lowering effect. Uh, of course, we need to mention uh, beta agonists used in respiratory diseases. Uh, so I mentioned your, you know, albuterols and things of uh, salmeterol, things of, of that nature. Propranolol can potentially blunt the benefit. It can block the effects of those beta agonists. So you've got to watch your patients um, who are taking inhalers closely um, because propranolol can worsen respiratory status. Really, really important there. And then I also uh, look at that medication list and think about our patients with diabetes. If you see patients on sulfonylureas, insulin, um, you got to remember that these patients are at hypoglycemic risk and propranolol can potentially blunt some of those symptoms of hypoglycemia. So that's really, really important to remember, really, really important to educate patients on. Uh, and I think that's going to wrap up uh, the drug interaction section for today. Uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, leave us a rating review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. That's greatly appreciated. Uh, share us with classmates, colleagues, um, definitely anyone who could benefit from pharmacology education. Uh, we greatly appreciate uh, you all sharing that and obviously helping this podcast grow. Uh, go support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. Uh, your contributions uh, there directly uh, help us keep this podcast funded and help us keep it going uh, with new drugs and um, new medications uh, that are coming out so you guys can be uh, on the front lines learning about them and obviously uh, helping to expand your uh, clinical knowledge base. Uh, go to reallifepharmacology.com, sign up there, uh, get the free PDF, of course. Uh, and uh, as always, if you have comments, suggestions about what drugs to cover uh, or any other issues you, you may have experienced, uh, don't hesitate to reach out, mededucation101 at gmail.com or else track me down on LinkedIn is the uh, social media network uh, that I'm most active on. All right, well, I'm going to sign off for today. Thank you so much for listening. Hope you found this beneficial and I hope you have a great rest of your day.